While I've been doing these programs, I've always felt that I'm kind of preaching to the choir with this particular study that we're going to do this evening. However, each time we've done the study, I found out there's a whole lot of questions that everybody has. And so I'm really not, even though I kind of am. Um, which puts me kind of in an interesting situation, but that's okay. Did you have any announcements before we get started? Oh, cool. Yes, the ones that have not received the form to sign, I have them here, please. After the first tonight, come and get the form. You need to send it and give it back to me tonight. Um, also, if you need to know about the showers, here with my husband, he, he can explain to you all the showers work, because I think if I took a shower and it's cold, they didn't turn the. Um, and then he started to get the water. Yeah, we were down checking. Can you drink the water from the shower? Can you drink the water from the shower? It's from a hose. I would, I would, it's from a hose, but it's coming through a water hose. I wasn't right. It's from your well, though, right? It's, it's from the well. well. It's, it's, from it's coming well. through a water hose. You know, if you brush your teeth or. Yeah, that's. I wouldn't would be drinking from it constantly. <laughs> If you're going to get water out of the spigot, I'd just take it out of the spigot like right there where the hose is not connected. Okay. Thank you. Well, we have a sink up. Did you just say well, so you we have a sink over here in front of the greenhouse? Yes, the sink. wash dishes or wash your hands. And the sink is a drinking water safe hose. Okay. okay, I think we're ready. Okay, let's turn to John 14, verse 26. Hopefully you have that promise memorized by the end of things here too. Uh, yeah, and for uh, people that are watching this on video, uh, if you would like the study guide and quote sheet that goes with this, is go to www.preparingtostand.org and uh, go on to the studies menu and you'll find it there under the Get Ready, Get Ready, Get Ready series. Five yes, we're doing study number five tonight. Okay, John 14, verse 26. What's the promise there? Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will do what? Yeah, he will come and teach us all things. Okay, including the stuff we did this afternoon. And the stuff we'll be doing during the practical classes. The rest of the program here, too. Uh, you remember the quotation in Review and Herald, March 22, 1887. It's quotation number two. If we want the Holy Spirit, what's our responsibility? Clear the way. Clear the way. How do we clear the way? Okay, make sure there's nothing standing between us and God. Remove every hindrance. Okay, so is the way still clear? Or is something slipped in? Okay, with a group this size, who knows? Possibilities. So, as we get started here this evening, we're going to invite you to clear the way. We'll also pray for the Holy Spirit. If anything's come between you and God, be willing to set that aside. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you again that you haven't left us to our own understanding, that you promised to send your, your Holy Spirit to teach us all things. And we claim that promise this evening. And we realize that uh, we have our responsibility also, that we not just ask for the Holy Spirit, but that we actually clear the way there's anything standing between you and us, may we be willing to set it aside so that we can hear your voice distinctly and that you can speak to us directly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning we talked about the Olivet Discourse. Remember Matthew 24 and 25. <clears throat> Uh, the main theme there is like end time event stuff, uh, but we also noticed that there was a sub-theme 
okay, of um, watch out for that you're not deceived. Okay, that was on Jesus' heart and mind, and we looked at several examples there. There's another sub-theme uh, in the Olivet Discourse that is probably best described in verse 44. So let's turn there. Matthew 24, verse 44. Matthew 24, verse 44. Okay, because we don't know exactly when Jesus is coming, what are we told to do? Be ready. Be ready. Okay, that goes with the get ready, get ready, get ready theme that we have for this program. And so if you aren't ready, get ready. And then once you are ready, stay ready so that whatever happens, you will be ready. Okay, again, this is uh, another sub-theme throughout this. Uh, let me give a couple examples. Look at chapter 25, verse 10. Okay, who were those who went into the wedding? Okay, you know it's the wise, but how are they described in this verse? The ready. The ready. Uh-huh, it doesn't say the wise virgins went in with them. It says those who were ready went in. Okay, so here's an example of this be ready, sub-theme. Uh, another example is over in verses 17 and 18. Okay, Matthew 24, verses 17 and 18. And here we find that, you know, we need to be ready because when the time comes, it's too late to get ready. But while we're on these verses, we need to look at something else. And um, these verses talk, for those of you who are, don't have Bibles, these verses talk about the person who's on the housetop. What's he supposed to do when the time comes to flee? Okay, not come down and get anything out of the house, just go. Now, you might have to come off the roof, but you just need to go. And the person who's out in the field, who's laid aside his garment because it got hot, what's he supposed to do? Run. Just go. And so we have to ask the question, was the person who fled without taking anything, even their jacket, or cloak is more actual translation maybe, were they ready? No. Okay, we're tempted to think yes. But the reason for that is so often we just look at one verse and we just look at the verse and what the verse says and based on that, yeah, we draw conclusions. But let's look at the bigger picture. Where were they to flee? Mountains. To the mountains. And so picture a person fleeing to the mountains without taking their cloak. Or even their cloak. Okay? Okay. Here we are in the mountains, and we have good weather to illustrate this. Okay, imagine spending the night out in the woods because you fled without taking anything. Okay, are you ready for your first night in the woods? No. And so this person who fled without taking anything, maybe he was ready to obediently flee, but he wasn't ready for his first night in the woods. Or for the next day, or for the next night, you see where I'm going with this? Okay, so these purple people, even though they appear to be ready, they're really not. Was there an angel at the crossroads passing out blankets to the unprepared? No. No. Okay, if there was, we should expect that there would also be an angel passing out extra oil to the ones who didn't take enough oil with them. And that isn't the way that parable went down at all. In fact, because they weren't ready with enough oil, they end up being left out. 
And so maybe we need to look at a little more closely these verses and what it means to be ready. Oh, talking about the angel passing out blankets. Acts 12, verse 6. Acts 12, verse 6. This is a story where Peter's in prison and the angel comes to break him out of prison. Okay, so the angel hits Peter to wake him up. What does the angel tell him? He says, grab your cloak. Let's put your sandals on. Grab your cloak. Let's go. Why did the angel bother to tell him that? It was cold outside. Read what it says in the, about that experience in Acts of the Apostles. Okay, God knows we have need of certain things. And here's Peter, he's kind of, you know, he's been sleeping. An angel wakes him up all of a sudden, he's still a little bit groggy. He's not sure whether he's seeing a vision, you know, or dreaming this, or whether it's actually happening. And so the angel, in kindness, tells him, you know, put your shoes on, grab your cloak, it's cold outside, you're going to need it. Yeah. Again, God knows we need these things. Okay, to be ready, we need to have them. Because when the time comes to flee, it's going to be too late to go back and get them. So, let's look at these verses here. In these verses is Matthew 24, 17 and 18. Is Jesus telling us to drop everything and run? Okay, frequently we're tempted to think yes. But I think the reason we jump to that conclusion is because of the way we were taught to do fire drills back in grade school. And just for what it's worth, the last year that I taught professionally, I'm still teaching, but you know what I mean. Uh, I taught upper elementary at the Adventist school in Cortez, Colorado. And we experimented with this a little bit. Now let me assure you, it is much easier to teach kids to drop everything and run than it is to teach them to pick up selected items on the way out of the room without going back. Okay, so Jesus did not say drop everything and run. He just said don't go back. Okay, reread it if you have to. I want you to see it there. And there's a big difference between dropping everything and running and not going back. What's the blank for 2B? 2B is... So... So, if we had something with us... Well, let's just run through the little scenario here. Let's, let's go with the person who's working out in the field and it gets hot and he takes his cloak off, sets it by the corner, edge of the field where he can pick it up easily on his way back to the city. Okay, he's living in Jerusalem during this time just before the armies came to surround the city. Okay, so he's working away, he's left his cloak over there towards the city, <clears throat> he's working away and he hears some funny noises up by the city. He looks up and there's the arm, Roman army surrounding the city. What's the first thing he thinks of? That's the sign Jesus gave. Okay, when you see the army surrounding the city, flee. Which way is he going to flee? Away from the city. Oh, what's the second thing he thinks of? My cloak. I wore it because it was cold this morning. It's going to be cold tonight again. I'm going to need that cloak, but obediently he flees without it. Okay, let's back the clock up a little bit. It hasn't quite gotten that warm yet. He still has his cloak on. He hears the noises up by the city. It's time to flee. Can he take his cloak with him or does he have to leave it behind? Based on these, on Matthew 24, 17 and 18, would it be okay for him to take his cloak with him or does he have to leave it behind? Yeah, fine for him to take it with him. He just can't go back. If you, if you got it with you already, fine, take it. Can't go back where? To the city? Well, or to the edge of the field closest to the cities. Most to just flee. And also, let's say he's working with a tool that would be helpful in a survival situation. Okay, could he take that along too? Sure. 
Okay, so in these verses, Jesus is not telling us to drop everything and run. It is okay to take things with you. Unfortunately, a lot of our brothers and sisters have interpreted this to mean we're supposed to drop everything and run, so you can't take anything with you anyway, so there's no point in preparing. But that's not an accurate interpretation of these verses. And if you're on the housetop, can you come down back into the house to get you back? What's it say? Verse 17, what's it say? Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Yeah, that's what it says. Have it with you, um, when Titus's father first came to Jerusalem, he came to besiege it, but they notified him that he was next in line to be uh, the king of uh, Rome. So he dropped what he was doing and left. And it was a six-month term before Titus came back and besieged the city. So God was telling the people, you can't sell your house now if you didn't sell it before. You can't take your furniture and all that stuff. Just take the essentials and get out now. And they had six months to get out. And it was implied that they were not supposed to take their stuff and pack it up. They were supposed to take the bare minimum and get out of the city before Titus came back. And from what I understand now, when we see the Sunday law established, We'll have six months to, to get to the country, and you know, if we haven't done it already, and that's why we're having these classes to do it beforehand, to get out beforehand before the Sunday law comes, which is coming soon. It, it isn't that what, uh, I understand what you're saying. You missed this morning, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, those of us who were here this morning, let's review a little bit. Destruction of Jerusalem time. When did the armies come and surround the city? Uh -huh. What time of year? In the fall of 66 A.D. This was uh, Cestius, by the way, was the general. When did Titus come back? What time of year? Spring. Spring of 70 AD. How long's in between? Roughly three and a half years. Check your history. Okay, don't take my word for it. Check your history. Uh, excellent resource for this is the first chapter in Great Controversy and the Jerusalem entry in the SDA Bible Commentary, Bible Dictionary. Why did Jesus tell these people here, when you see the army surrounding, get out, get out now, don't go back to get anything, if they weren't coming back for three and a half years? Because you need have time to establish your... Gardens and whatnot. I think that it was a matter of obedience. What? I think it's a matter of obedience. It's a matter, it is a matter of obedience, but there's more to it than that. I, I really wish I had the quote here. I don't have it with me. I need to get it, because this came up with the last group, too. I can give you the reference for it, though. Um, anyway, I'll do that tomorrow. I got it on my computer. Basically, though, if you read that first chapter in Great Controversy, okay, Ellen White doesn't come right out and say it. But you get the distinct idea that as soon as the Christians left at this point, because they fled right here, they got out right away. As soon as the Christians left, the Holy Spirit was also withdrawn from the city. Okay, do you want to be a, in a city when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from that city? No. Okay, there's a quote that says, they must not hesitate a moment, but leave immediately. 
lest they be involved in the general destruction. You know, what was the general destruction? Romans didn't come back for three and a half years to destroy the city. It had to be, it wasn't a physical destruction. That didn't happen for three and a half years. So it had to be a spiritual thing that they had to flee from. And again, you know, you read through there, you get the idea. It doesn't spell it out exactly. But you get the idea that the Holy Spirit was withdrawn as soon as the Christians left. And that's why they had to leave and leave now. Great controversy 25 and 4. Do you have it, have it there? Oh, yes. What do you? 25.4? Yes. Which? Uh, it's it's on one, it, She's oh, it's on your phone. Yes. They must not hesitate. Let's the bill. Oh, thank you. Yeah, okay, this is it. Chapter 25 or page 25? Page 25. This is chapter 1. Yeah, let me back up here so I'm with the camera. Okay, great controversy. Let's see. Let me back up just a bit. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city wall, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. Throughout the land of Judea, as well as in Jerusalem itself, the signal for flight must be immediately obeyed. He who chanced to be upon the housetop must not go down to his house even to save his most valuable treasures. Those who are working in the fields or vineyards must not take time to return for the outer garment laid aside while they should be toiling in the heat of the day. They must not hesitate a moment lest they be involved in the general destruction. Okay? So they were to get out and get out now. Thank you. The evils that was going on in the, hmm? the, evils that was going on in the city, and that's why the, the Romans destroyed the temple when they came back. Yeah. Okay, again, read that whole chapter. Okay, it talks about the horrible things that went on in the city. And one of the reasons the Romans heard, I mean, were so destructive was because they kept, there was people that were sneaking out trying to get wild edible plants and stuff growing outside the city and they got captured and the Romans heard stories of what was going on inside the city and they were like, these people aren't even human, they need to be destroyed. I mean, the things that they were doing. That was when they came back, yes. Yes, that was when they came back during the, during the final siege. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that stuff had already started. Perhaps the reason that you must flee right away, too, is the same reason that when the door, when the, the last chance to get on the ark was there, you, you don't delay. You right. Because you might change your mind. Okay, what she said was, this also goes like when the last chance to came to get on the ark in Noah's day. I mean, you had to get on because the door was going to close right away. You know, don't hesitate. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 24. We looked at verse 44 earlier. That's the verse that said, be ready. This paragraph actually starts with verse 42, which has very similar wording. And there's two things we're told to do because we don't know exactly when Jesus comes. And what are those? We're to watch and be ready. With that in mind, it says, watch and be ready. Okay, this Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44. Uh, let's flip over to Revelation 16, 15, where real similar wording is used. But it says something else besides be ready, which helps expand the idea. Revelation 16, 15. So 
says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who does what? Watches. Who watches and does what? Keeps, Keeps his garments. Lest he, be, lest he walk naked and they see the shame, and they see his shame. So in this verse, it says, you know, instead of saying watch and be ready, it's saying watch and keep your garments. So that you're not naked. How do we keep our garments so that we are not naked? We keep our clothes on. Okay? And so that's the idea here. Our readiness needs to be, that's who we are. Okay? We keep it on. Okay, the person who had to flee without even taking his cloak, he wasn't keeping his garments. So what is the garments? Well, here it's symbolic of Christ's righteousness. But let's not forget over or overlook the physical lesson that that spiritual lesson comes from. Because they both go together. So, maybe we need to redefine what it means to be ready. I'm going to start with uh, Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8. Are called, there are several disasters listed there, and these are called the end-time birth pangs. I'm going to go with that imagery first here. Okay, the pregnant lady who's ready, what has she done? Uh, Matthew 24, 6 through 8. Talks about the end time, like the disasters in the end times, refers to them as birth pains. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow night. Okay, so just think about a pregnant lady. Okay, again, we're looking at the physical lesson that that spiritual lesson comes from. So a lady who's pregnant, and she's ready. What has she done? She has her bag or suitcase packed, and where is it sitting? By the door. By the door. That's okay, she realizes she's going into labor. What does she do? Walks out the door, grabs the bag on the way out. Okay, off to the maternity unit. Okay, the motion picture industry has had a lot of fun showing the foolish things that people do when they're not ready for the lady to go into labor. But I think that's exactly the point. We do foolish things when we're not ready. Okay, the lady who is ready, no foolishness, no running around, just like, okay, it's time to go. Grab the bag on the way, out you go. Kim. So is that really Matthew 24, 6 through 8, or is that another place? Pardon? The reference Matthew 24, 6 through 8, is that where that's at? Yes. Well, that's, that's where it equates the end times with labor pains. We're going to look at that in more detail tomorrow night. It says this is the beginning of sorrows. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we need to look at the other verse. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 or is it 5 verse 3? It's 5 verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. The same Greek word that was translated sorrows in Matthew 24, verse 8. Okay, is translated as travail in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. And what's it a direct reference to? A woman with child. Pregnant lady going into labor. Okay. So some of the more modern translations translate it that way. Calls these disasters, these are the beginning of the end time birth pains. Because that word sorrows, that's exactly what it's talking about. Again, we're going to study that some more tomorrow night. So, pregnant lady who's ready, she has her bags all packed, sitting by the front door, ready to go. How are they to eat the Passover? Exodus 12, verse 11. 
dressed and ready to leave. Uh-huh, they were all dressed, all packed, ready to go, just waiting for the signal. Mm -hmm. So that when they got the signal, they could just go. And they celebrated that yearly. Okay, so that imagery would be fresh in their head. Let me share another story with you. So a couple examples here. <clears throat> we call it Kawakla's story. It's a story we got a hold of. How, do you know anything about the Apache Indians? But they rode ponies. What? They rode ponies. They rode ponies. They sure did. Where do they live? Where do the Apaches live? Anybody know? Plains. Where? The Chiricahua Mountains. Yeah. That was the name of one of their sub-tribes. Okay. The Apache lived in the uh, Arizona, New Mexico area. Okay. What kind of country is that? Desert. Desert. Is that easy to survive there or hard to survive there? Uh-huh, hard to survive there. But these people did very well there. They're one of the groups that gave the cavalry the most trouble. Because they were masters of desert survival. Okay, the reason they were able to do so well there is because they were masters of desert survival. I mean, they were living it day after day. For generations, they knew how to deal with the desert. And so this story is a true story. happened in 1878, I believe. It's about a group, the Warm Springs Band, who were forced on the reservation over in Arizona. San Carlos Reservation. They said it was the worst place in that whole area. You know, white people took all the good places. And they weren't doing very well there because it's such a bad place to live. Okay, babies were dying and old people were dying prematurely because it was a bad place to live. And finally they decided, this is stupid. We'll die fighting before we just sit here and die. And so they escaped back to their ancestral homeland over in New Mexico in doing so, they knew it would just be a matter of time before the cavalry showed up with orders basically to kill them all. And so this story that's, is about that story. And recommend reading it. It's um, in a book called In the Days of Victorio by Eve Ball. And I just want to <clears throat> tell you about some of the things they do because they knew they were going to get attacked and they knew they would have to flee. Okay, they taught their kids games to teach the kids skills that they would need when they fled. They had prearranged rendezvous points. They trained themselves to take certain equipment items. The story is told, interestingly enough, from the perspective of a three or four year old boy. And this is one of the things he says in that story, he says, I too had a food bag. Oh, they wore food bags 24-7. Food bag is like a tubular sack, maybe about this long, so big. And they had straps on the end so they could tie it around their waist. They wore it in the small of their back. Okay, they wore these things 24-7. They knew they were going to have to flee, so that would give them some food for when they fled. And he says, I too had a food bag, a small one containing mesquite bean meal. For months, no Apache child had been without his emergency rations, nor had he slept without an admonition not to remove it and not to abandon his blanket in case of attack. My food bag had never left me day or night. Okay, so when the parents would tuck them in at night, the parent would also remind them, like, don't take your food bag off to sleep, even if it's uncomfortable. And if we're attacked during the night, be sure to take your blanket with you. What kind of food did they have? Pardon? What kind of food? What kind of food? Uh, he had mesquite bean meal in his. Uh, the story is about him and his grandmother escaping. She had, like, jerky, ground-up jerky in hers. She also slept with her knife all the time. That's interesting. 
So, when these people were attacked, they fled. They had what they needed with them. Another story that sort of goes with this one is, uh, you know, you can uh, get training, like military, civilians can get military training. They have programs that you can go to. And I happened to uh, walk through the room. Somebody was watching one of these. You know, I just caught part of it, but the part that I caught was significant. Um, it was a group of civilians who were getting British SAS uh, desert survival training. Now, do you know who the British SAS are? Maybe some of you do, some don't. Okay, the British SAS are like the equivalent of our Navy, Navy SEALs or Airborne Rangers. Okay, Special Forces Unit. And so, as part of their training, they experienced a mock night raid. And they had a prearranged rendezvous point where they were going to meet back up again. And so after the raid, here's one of the participants coming into the rendezvous point, and they're met by one of the instructors. And the instructor says, where's your equipment? And the participant says, well, I was being shot at, so I just ran for my life. And the instructor severely reprimanded them, you know, basically saying, like, if, if, the desert does, like, if the bullets don't kill you, the desert will. Never leave your equipment behind. Okay, like the, peop like the, the Apaches, Special Forces units, uh, and I've heard this from several different Special Forces units uh, around the world, they are trained when they are on a mission to keep their pack at arm's length, no farther away. Anytime they use anything, they put it right back so that whatever happens, they just reach over and grab it and they're off and they're ready for action. Okay? Brothers and sisters, that's what it means to be ready. You realize in the end times here, we are God's special forces unit. And we looked at the parable of the ten virgins earlier. It was those who were ready that went into the wedding. Okay, I mentioned this earlier. The, the, all ten girls, they had a job to do to light the way to the wedding. Five of them had prepared themselves to be able to serve even if things didn't go exactly according to plan. The foolish virgins had not prepared themselves. And when they went to get ready, by the time they got ready, it was too late. The door was shut. Okay, so I think we kind of need to relook at what it means to be ready. You know, with definitions like this, it kind of puts a whole new slant on things. Okay, if the person on the rooftop was ready, his pack's right there. All he has to do is reach over, grab the pack, and go. Same thing with the person out working out in the field. If he's ready, all he has to do is reach over and grab his pack and go. And he's not leaving anything behind. It's one of the reasons I'm stressing get your equipment packed together so much. Okay, we kind of have a real watered-down version of what it means to be ready. You know, there is no angel at the crossroads packing, passing out survival packs to those who are unprepared. Besides, looking at the history of this a little bit. Think about the stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Okay, who was in charge of Jerusalem? In the store, yeah, the Romans, they were in charge of the city. And by the way, in Daniel 9, it says the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So that meant it had to be the Romans because the, the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks had already passed off the scene. Rome was the one that was there. You know, it's not some invading force. It's the Romans that are going to destroy the city. Why would the Romans come and destroy the city? They own it. Can you picture us being in Jerusalem, you know, in the time after Christ said these things, before, the, before this all happened? And we're like, how is this prophecy going to be fulfilled? You know, we're wondering how it's going to be fulfilled, just like we're wondering how some of the prophecies now for the end times are going to be fulfilled. But you know what happened? 
in the spring of AD 66. spring of 86 was the great Jewish revolt. I mean, they talk about that one in the history books. You can look up and find interesting stuff about it on YouTube. Yeah. They said it was the equivalent of Julius Caesar conquering France, or Gaul as they called it back then. It was a major operation. So in the spring of 8066, the Jews revolt against Rome. Well, hey, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's going to happen next, right? You know, Rome, okay, the legs of iron, the iron kingdom of Rome. They're just they're going to come back and reconquer. It's just a matter of time. And sure enough, half a year later, they came back. And so the people who were watching and ready basically had half a year's notice. It was only those who, if so, if we are watching and ready as Jesus told us to be, there's no reason why anyone would have to flee without even taking their cloak. Okay, why would you go out and work in the field? Oh, let's ask another question here first. How fast can a horse run? 35, 40. Yeah, like 35 miles an hour. Okay, how far does the army watch in a day? 15. No, it's like, yeah, you know, well, 20 miles is a good day for marching. And so, basically, in an hour, the horse can run twice as far as the army can go in a day. Okay, the Jews revolted. They set up their own government. They started printing their own money, everything. And for sure, they would have sent out scouts. And so the scout comes running into town. Hey, the Romans are two days out. Okay, if you knew that, if you're watching, you would know that. If you weren't watching, you might not. If you knew the Romans were coming, why would you go out and work in your field? The Romans are just going to come and overrun it anyway. What would be the point? So, if we are watching and ready as Jesus told us to be, there's no reason why anyone would have to flee without even taking their cloak. It would... It would only be those who are not watching and not ready that would have to flee without taking anything. There was a lot of infighting going on. Between a the lot of infighting going on. They had food stores that were lasting for years, but they put it on fire themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Selfishness. Turn to quotation number 40. <coughs> it's a real interesting quotation. Some Testimonies of Church, Volume 4, page 44, 45. It says, Presumption is a what? Common, Common temptation. And as Satan assails men with this, he obtains the victory how often? Nine times out of ten. That's a lot. And then it goes on to describe what presumption is. The promises of God are not for us rashly to claim while we rush on recklessly into danger. Violating the laws of nature and disregarding prudence and judgment which God has endowed us. This is the most flagrant presumption. So would running into the forest, okay, running into the mountains unprepared would that be rushing recklessly into danger yes. yeah would that be violating the laws of nature yeah. Yeah, essentially you're going to freeze to death would that be disregarding prudence and good judgment yeah therefore what would it be to run off into nature and, and uh, you know, flee to the mountains without taking anything and yet expect God to take care of us. What would that be? 
Presumption. Okay, 7b, we know we are going to be going into the wilderness. We know we are going to flee to the mountains. We know we're going to go to the wilderness. So wouldn't fleeing unprepared and unequipped yet claiming God's promises actually be presumption? Now before you start thinking about all the cool things you want to bring along in your pack, keep in mind that flee means what? Traveling light. Uh-huh, move fast and travel light. Possibly from angry mobs. So no heavy packs full of enough toilet paper and food to last until Jesus comes. Instead, our packs should be lightweight and low bulk, containing only key equipment for, what, for processing what God has provided for us in nature. And that's the list we put together this afternoon. Let's look at quotation number 42. This is Early Writings, page 56. Yeah, we're just going to read the first sentence right now. It says, The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provisions for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. What does that sound like? Okay, a lot of people have looked at that and says, hey, it says right there, we're not supposed to prepare. Yeah, I had one person tell me, it's clear to me, we're not supposed to prepare. However, does that one statement negate everything else that we've been talking about? Look at the next quote. It's a great controversy, page 371. It says, one saying of the Savior must not be made to do what? To destroy another. One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. I bring this up for two reasons, because it figures into what we're studying about here. But the other reason is this Bible study method that I keep hearing about more and more. It scares me. And basically what that method does is it collects all the verses and quotations to support one side of the argument, and all the verses and quotations to collect, you know, collect it to support the other side of the argument, and then you kind of go with the weight of evidence. That's making one saying of the Savior destroy another. Okay, we can't do that. The, way, the proper way is to see how all these things go together perfectly. But instead what people are doing is they're like, oh, this says don't prepare. Well, yeah, there's these other ones that say do, but this is a real strong, straightforward statement. So obviously we must not supposed to be preparing. Well, that's just because we don't understand it properly. Properly, Everything God has says goes together perfectly. So, we need to look at this quote a little more. Let's go ahead and read the whole quotation now. And as we're reading, I want you to notice the context. Okay, it kind of has a wilderness context. So this is talking about the time when we flee. Uh, that we talked about this morning, when we flee to the most desolate and solitary places. Uh, also notice that the main issue here is trusting wholly in God. It says, The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it's contrary to the Bible to make any provisions for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that the saints had food laid up by them in, or in the field in the time of trouble when sword famine and pestilence are in the land. It would be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God, and He will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water should be sure at that time, that we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, He would send ravens to feed us as He did feed Elijah, or rain manna from heaven as He did for the Israelites. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble, for they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs, and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. 
Now keep in mind the timeline that we put on the board this morning. Okay, this talks about this. Did you notice the wilderness context as we read that? Yes. Okay, so I think this is talking about our final flight, which is after probation closes. And so after probation closes, it's after we're not able to buy or sell anymore. And so houses and lands during this time cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth because probation is already closed and there, nothing can advance the cause of present truth anymore. So this is talking about that time. Okay, let's go back and look at that one phrase uh, kind of in the middle there where it talks about God being able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. Do you see that part? Let me kind of underline uh, that a little bit. We shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. Let's look at quotation number 45 with that one in mind. It uses real similar wording. This is Ministry of Healing, page 200. It says, The mountains and hills are changing, the earth is waxing old like a garment, but the blessing of God which spread for his people a table in the wilderness, what's the last three words? Will never cease. Okay, when did that will never cease begin? Way back at the beginning, right? Yeah, back at creation. And with that in mind, think about all of the various groups of native peoples that have lived off the, these wilderness blessings as they've lived off the land for thousands of years. Oh, I skipped something on the thing. All right, let's go to quotation number 44. This is Steps to Christ, page 123. Should have looked at this first, but that's, it'll work. We skip 41, too. We skip 41, too? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, well, that goes with something else there, though. Okay, Steps to Christ, page 123. It says, In his Sermon on the Mount, Christ taught his disciples precious lesson in regard to the necessity of trusting in God. Here's another quote that deals with trusting in God. These lessons were designed to encourage the children of God through all ages. And they've come down to our time, so they also apply to us, full of instruction and comfort. The Savior pointed his followers to the birds of the air as they warbled their carols of praise, unencumbered with thoughts of care. For they sow not, neither do they reap. And yet the Great Father provides for their needs. The Savior asks, are you no much better than they? Okay, the implication there, if God takes care of the birds, for sure he's going to take care of us. The great provider for man and beast opens his hands and supplies all his creatures. The birds of the air are not beneath his notice. And notice the next sentence here, at least the first part of it, underline that. He does not do what? He does not drop the food into their bills but he makes provision for their needs. They must gather the grains he has scattered for them. They must prepare the materials for their little nests. They must feed their young. Okay, just like the native peoples, just like the birds. Okay, they have to go out and gather what God has provided in nature. We experimented with that a little bit this afternoon. And then they have to bring it back and craft some things to end up with what they need. Let's look at another quotation, number 17. Quotation number 17. This is about the children of Israel at the Red Sea. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 290. God in his providence brought the Hebrews into the mountain fastness before the sea that he might manifest his power and their deliverance and singly humble the pride of his oppressors. 
He might have saved them in any other way. But he chose this method in order to test their faith and strengthen their trust in him. So this is quotation number 17. Pardon? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 290. Okay, reading on. The people were weary and terrified, yet if they had held back when Moses bade them advance, God never would have opened the path for them. It was by faith that they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. In marching down to the very waters, they showed that they believed the word of God as spoken by Moses. And underline this next sentence here. They did what? All that was in their power to do. And then the mighty one of Israel divided the sea to make a path for their feet. So evidently, trusting wholly in God includes doing all that is in our power to do. Now please understand, it's very important that what we are doing is accordance with God's will. Because God was the one that told them to go forward. And so they obeyed his voice and they went forward. <coughs> They did all that there was in their power to do, and then God opened the Red Sea for them. I think the part of the trouble is our human reasoning. Okay, we think if it's gonna, if we have to trust wholly in God, if we do any itty bitty teeny weeny part of it, then it's not wholly God's doing. That God doesn't look at things the way we do. Remember Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. And so we need to do it God's way and not tell God how to save us. So trusting wholly in God includes doing all that is in our power to do. Okay, let's go back to the early writings. 56 quotation which is per, uh, quotation number 42. And look at the first two words in the last sentence in the first paragraph. Okay, the first two words of the last sentence in the first paragraph. This is a sentence about the ravens and manna. Okay, now I used to look, I overlooked this for a long time. I used to tell people, and, and I still hope this way, but I just tell people, I hope I'm in the group that gets manna because I'd like to see what that stuff's about. But what are those first two words? If necessary. Okay, if necessary, God will send ravens or send manna. So what if the ravens or manna aren't necessary? How's God going to provide for us? Okay, through the things he's already placed in nature. Same like he provided for the birds and provided for the native peoples. Okay, like the birds and native peoples, we will have to gather and craft God's wilderness blessings. Now with that in mind, I heard about this from some native group. I, I'm not sure which native group it is. I really wish I knew. But they had the idea of the sacred, what they called the sacred hunt. And their idea of the sacred hunt is basically the same thing as Matthew 7.7 7 and Philippians 4.19 rolled together. Okay, Matthew 7.7, 7, Jesus says what? Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. And then Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, right? And so their idea of the sacred hunt was as they prayed, as they asked for what they needed, and as they went out hunting for it, as they seek, okay, the Creator would somehow bring them and what they needed together. Okay, let's look at Last Day Events, page 265, and put this together with what we read earlier. 
This is number 46, quotation number 46. Okay, this goes together with uh, the promise in Isaiah 33, 16. It says, you know, bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. But this says bread and water is what? All. All that is promised to the remnant in the time of trouble. And as Jesus said in uh, the passage there in Matthew 6 about the birds, you know, there's more to life than food. And so the idea I want to throw out here is that we can be very well fed and hydrated and still be very cold and uncomfortable. You know, life-threateningly cold and uncomfortable. And so there's more that we need to learn about being out in the wilderness than just what we can eat. Um, and part of the reason I'm saying that is there is a group I knew about. I haven't had any contact with any of them for years now, so I don't know what's happened there. But it's like their whole wilderness survival thing was just wild edible plants. I mean, they, they thought they were doing wilderness survival, but all they were doing was wild edible plants. You know, there's more to life than food, like Jesus said. And so we need to learn how to do other things besides just eat. And we talked about some of that this afternoon. So, how are we going to get ready? Okay, by learning what to gather. Okay, that's one of the identification knowledge things we talked about earlier. And how to craft the things of nature. Okay, that's the skills part we talked about. So, in closing, number 14 on the study guide. What is that first sentence that we read about it being contrary? Okay, I'll read it again here. It says, the Lord has shown me that it's repeatedly that it's contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. What does that sentence mean? Well, the very next sentence explains it. What's the very next sentence about? It says, I saw that if the saints had food laid up. What does that mean? Have food laid up. Uh-huh, stocking up food. For the time of trouble. In other words, you're trying to stock up enough food to last until Jesus comes. Not supposed to do that. So that the saints have food laid up by them or in the field. Okay, I've heard about people stashing stuff out in the woods for, one, for the time of trouble. Not supposed to do that either. What if we get led a totally different way? Please note that this stocking up is different from storing up enough of this year's harvest to last until next year, which we're going to be doing during the first part of the time of trouble, when we can't buy or sell, growing or raising our own provisions like we talked about this morning. Okay, storing up enough of this year's harvest to last until next year, maybe a little extra and in case a few more people show up or whatever. That's fine. Okay, that's common practice in agricultural lifestyle, what we'll be living at that time. It's not trying to stock up enough to last until Jesus comes. And by extension, that same principle, when we flee, we shouldn't try to carry enough food and toilet paper in our packs to last until Jesus comes either. Okay, I remember talking with this about, a, I mean, about this with a group of people once, and one of the people said, well, my pack's going to be really heavy, you know, if we're going to be there for a long time. But that's not what we're supposed to do. Okay, we're supposed to rely on what God provides, which he's put into nature already. And so we need to be carrying those key equipment items so that we can process those things that, are, that God has put out there. If necessary, he'll send the ravens or manna. But if it's not necessary, we're going to be gathering and crafting. Okay, let's have prayer. I guess we're done. Well, I see a lot of cold people out there. <laughs> I'm cold myself. Father, thank you for showing us what it means to be ready. May we not be presumptuous, but prepare. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.